Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, this is Kurt Angle, and welcome to The Kurt Angle Show. First off, I want to thank all the listeners for tuning into our podcast today. We have a very special episode for you. We're going to be covering my 20-year anniversary with my match against Chris Benoit. It was a pinfall submission ladder match where I held my gold medals high above the ring. It was Judgment Day 2001, and we're going to talk about all the events leading up to it. But first, I want to introduce to you my co-host, the man that can save you money on your mortgage, Conrad Thompson. How you doing, Conrad? I'm good, dude. How are you? Excited to be here, man. This is going to be fun doing something a little different today. We're going to do a watch along. Uh, I don't think you and I have, have ever watched wrestling together. So this should be pretty oh, this fun. is our first. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm excited to do it. If you haven't already, you should definitely jump on the WWE network. They've got a great opportunity for you right now. I think you can still sign up and it's like five bucks a month. Kurt. It's hard to believe that we all grew up in the pay-per-view era. Oh, we were paying 40 bucks a month and now here it is. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper now. <laughs> no kidding. By the way, I also want to mention if you head over to boxagimmicks.com, we've got a brand new Kurt Angle show store. Our buddy Ryan and partner here on the show has created a ton of great new stuff, including an all over print shirt. Kurt, that feels like your deal all day. That's my deal. I have the all over print shirt on right now. <laughs> the Kurt Angle show. <laughs> oh, it's true. It's damn true. Check it out. It's over at boxagimmicks.com. But the reason we're here today is Judgment Day 2001. Kurt mentioned it. We're right here at the 20 year anniversary of the big show. It went down on May 20th at the Arco Arena in Sacramento, California. The event did really strong $670,000 at the gate. There's 13,623 fans in attendance, which is bigger than the prior Judgment Day. 405,000 homes would buy the pay per view. And we're just a few months after WrestleMania 17. So out of context, these numbers seem tremendous, but in the context of where we were just two months prior, it does feel like things are cooling off a little bit. Could you tell that already here? Yeah, I we knew that things were going to start cooling off. It, it was, you know, wrestling always goes in cycles. And, you know, we, we were having a difficult time adjusting from the Attitude Era over to the next era. And I think that, you know, uh, WCW going out of business uh, definitely uh, affected uh, the interest in wrestling because when you have a competitor, you have fans that are comparing back and forth and they have an option to choose from. Now they only had one company. I think that that's why business suffered a little bit. Let's look at some news and notes here as we head into this show. CBSMarketWatch.com would report that the company is going to start aggressively marketing overseas. And it does feel like that's always been Vince McMahon's sort of plan B. Uh, you look back to the early nineties, we'll say late 91, early 92, when things start to cool off for the world wrestling federation, he starts to do more international touring, including the big SummerSlam that happened in SummerSlam 92 over in Wembley stadium. And it feels as if Vince is about to hit that button again here. Were you excited to hear that? Hey, uh, we might be doing more international travel, or is that actually a negative when you're a talent on those seemingly endless flights? Well, it's both. 
we were so spoiled that, you know, for several years, we only had to wrestle in North America. Business was, business was so good. It was just booming. And I think that when ticket sales started to drop a little bit, Vince wanted to be ahead of the curve. So he started booking more international tours and we started going over there. And at first it was really cool, you know, going to see the cultures of the different countries, uh, sightseeing. But after a while it became a blur because we were, you know, wrestling 250, 300 days a year and travel just becomes travel. I mean, I really love performing for the international fans but it came, became a lot more difficult to do it. It became very hard on your body and your mind. I want to mention too, I feel like sometimes whenever you hear a guy who, who grew up in the wrestling business and he said something like you did there, Hey, we were on the road, 250, 300 days a year. Some people who just want to be argumentative would say, Oh no, the company only ran 176 That's shows right. that year or whatever. But the reality is when you factor in travel, You've got to get there the day before and you're going to leave the day after. So no matter what you're doing, you've got two extra days on your trip. Anyway, you slice it, right? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I, when I talk about 250, 300 shows a year, what I meant was that's how many days of the, of the year that we're on the road. Yeah. You're gone from home. That's really what we're talking about here. You're sacrificing family time. You're not in your own bed. You're not, you know, with your family, your wife and kids, you're somewhere living out of a suitcase, right? Yeah. You're almost gone almost every day of the week and including all the travel days. So you're looking at five to six days a week that you're traveling. I want to mention that uh, things are not slowing down for you at all. A uh, report in the observer says the WWF is going to start kicking off their smack down your vote campaign. And they're targeting high school students with you as the honorary chairman going on tour to these high schools and cities where there's going to be TV tapings. Uh, including Cincinnati, Louisville, San Jose, Anaheim, Minneapolis. Do you remember this SmackDown Your Vote speaking tour? Yes, I was really proud of it. I was the chairman of the SmackDown Your Vote campaign. I uh, went to high schools, spoke to young adults, uh, teenagers, about the importance of voting, uh, that there's nothing more American than voting. And we really pushed it hard, and we were very successful with the campaign. I want to mention something that, uh, isn't nearly as fun and feel good. There's a legendary match that happens around this time between Perry Saturn and an enhancement performer named Mike Bell. And it was going to be recorded for jacked or metal or one of those syndicated shows. Long story short, Mike Bell may or may not have botched a spot and Saturn took it personally when he landed, maybe a way he shouldn't have. And Saturn just lays into the guy in a major way. I mean, he beats the shit out of him. Do you remember this incident and what the fallout was from it, if there was any at all? Yes, I remember it. it. It was pretty sad. I mean, I'm glad that Perry admitted that he did wrong because what he did was wrong. When you have a less experienced wrestler that's so fired up to wrestle a WWE superstar and he has his only opportunity, he's going to get a little antsy. He's going to get real energetic and, you know, he might end up uh, losing his mind a little bit. And, what Perry did uh, after the kid botched the spot is beat the crap out. Yeah. Threw him outside the ring. He landed with his, you know, on his head on the concrete floor. And then uh, Perry jacked him up and ran him in, rammed him into the steps backward where the back of his head hit the steps. He beat the crap out of the guy. What you should do when a guy is, you know, a little antsy and, and you know, not doing what he was told you need to put them in a rest hold, you know, mm -hmm. choke them out a little bit and say, listen, kid, you're going to, you know, we're going to get through this. You need to stop screwing up, you know, follow me and let's get through this match together. And what Perry did was just beat him up. And uh, it was really sad, but I'm glad that Perry admitted it. Yeah. It comes out that, uh, well, Meltzer would write in the WWF, something like this isn't considered comedy. Saturn was sent home the next day because of the neck injury but he had his ass chewed out by management about what he did in the ring and was pretty well told in no uncertain terms that if he did it again, it would be the last time. And to your point, he admitted that what he did was definitely in the wrong. It is interesting to think about this though, because you know, a generation before this beating the shit out of enhancement talent was just, you know, Tuesday. So there have been some positive changes over the years to the wrestling business. Wouldn't you agree? 
Oh, without a doubt. I was told back then they would beat the crap out of each other. If you stiffed a person, you know, you'd beat the hell out of them. So, you know, a, a stiff kick and a stiff punch, it, it's acceptable to this day to stiff them back with a punch or a kick, but not a dangerous move. So if someone stiffs you with a punch or kick, you just give them a receipt to let them know, hey, hey don't do that again. And, uh, you know, that, that that's that's what hasn't changed in the business. But as far as a botched spot and beating the crap out of somebody, it has changed dramatically. Let's talk about uh, OVW for a minute here. It makes the Ross report that Eric Angle was on the shelf after a torn tricep in training and a subsequent surgery. We don't really spend a lot of time talking about Eric here on the show. Why don't you think he had a more sustainable run in the WWE? Well, my brother was getting it. He just wasn't getting it as quickly as I did. And I think the company was comparing him to me, mm. but he was getting it. He was, he was learning. He was improving dramatically. Uh, the, the unfortunate incident of him tearing his tricep, uh, the tendon right off the bone of his elbow, it rolled oh. up his arm. And he had to have surgery. So when he had the surgery, um, you know, the doctor performed the surgery. The next day, my brother was in excruciating pain. And he went back to the hospital and he said that there's something going on in my arm. I need to take this cast off. And they said, don't worry. It's just from the surgery. The pain will go away. So the next day, he went back to the hospital, said the same thing. And they told him, don't worry about it. Go home and rest. So the third day, he didn't have a saw. And he wanted to saw off the cast himself. So he went to the cast. Oh, my gosh. He did. He looked at the incision, and there was a huge infection. And he pushed on the incision. All this yellow and red pus came out. And he went directly to the hospital after the Home Depot. And he said, look, I told you there was an infection. But the hospital, to protect their ass and from liability, uh, said in the report that my brother – sawed off his cast and got the infection by sawing off his cast. You don't get an infection in 10 minutes. No. He was at the Home Depot 10 minutes prior to when he went to the hospital. Yeah. So they did that just to cover their ass, and it ended my brother's career. Oh, shit. He couldn't sue the doctor or the hospital. WWE let him go, and thank God they paid for his surgery before they let him go, which was pretty cool. So what did your brother pursue after wrestling? He, he's a personal trainer. He's been training people for years. That's what he did beforehand, and that's what he did afterward. I bring it up because uh, there's even a, a moment here when uh, I think OVW is running some shows at like the Louisville Gardens, and they're even teasing, hey, we might have an, uh, an Eric Kurt Angle tag team. Do you remember that ever being discussed as a potential idea if he did make his way to the main roster that maybe they would try you guys as a tag team? Oh, that was the plan. They, they wanted Eric and I to tag together. Uh, they thought if Eric improved enough that uh, he'd be a great tag team partner for me, we could have a good run as a tag team for a little while. But unfortunately, he got hurt and it never transpired. Let's, um, let's talk about Benoit for a minute here. He's one of the more respected wrestlers in the wrestling business at this moment. And a week prior to this, when he was doing a, a, a bit with Les Thatcher, he was given a private locker room as the stars get on Thatcher's casino shows, but Benoit refused to take it saying I'd rather that's something that has become a bit legendary. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Peacock played a whole documentary about the Miz and there's a lot of rumor and innuendo about Benoit and locker room etiquette. What do you remember about Benoit and his strong feelings about what should or shouldn't happen in a locker room? Well, he just felt that he, he didn't want any special treatment. He wanted to be treated just like the boys. He thought all the boys should be dressed, be, be dressing in the same locker room. Uh, he wasn't political by any means. He would never politic his way to the top. He always did it the right way. And Chris uh, was a, an upstanding individual. He that, That's how he felt. And that's how he felt about it, the boys. He felt that nobody should have special treatment. And there are some wrestlers that will take the private room. And, and why wouldn't you? I mean, if they offer it, you might as well take it. But Chris was very strong on his feet, operated from the boys. Let's talk about uh, 
you sort of laid the groundwork when you mentioned the style, the, the stipulations of this match or the style of this match we're going to be covering here with your match with uh, Benoit. Meltzer would say, including this match, that will make three lighter matches on pay per view already this year. We're only in May. And Meltzer says all these gimmicks that get over like ladder matches and hell in a cell that have replaced the cage match and battle Royals as the hot drawing gimmicks will also mean as much as the cage match and battle Royals, if they're done more than twice a year, let alone three times in five shows. After seeing what happened with WCW, every attempt to imitate their desperation booking pattern scares the hell out of me. I hope this is the last week I spend being horrified. So Meltzer suggesting, Hey guys. We're hitting the panic button too often here. We're reliant on gimmicks, maybe a little too much. We've just been covering your 2001 so far this year. And I tend to agree. It does feel like you've got this wrestling machine, even though that's not technically your gimmick name or at, at this time, but my God, this other shenanigans, if you will. Well, I think that the ladder matches became really popular and yeah. on to hit them. Well, was the popularity was soaring and with Chris and I, there weren't much other options. We were doing Iron Man matches, technical wrestling matches, wrestling, 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 wrestling. And, you know, that year we wrestled quite a bit. So we were running out of ideas and options. And they thought, why don't we make it a pinfall submission ladder match? Make it a little more creative for Kurt and Chris to kind of spread their creative wings and, and go beyond what they did before. And I think that was the idea of why they booked us in that match. Let's talk about how this whole thing really gets kicked off. Uh, Raw on April 30th does a 4.98 rating, and you open with an interview and get a bunch of great heat, according to Dave Meltzer. He would write, Benoit came out and the two got into a brawl, which had more action in one minute than in the rest of the show combined. The upshot of all this was Benoit left with Angle's medals, Angle, and far too comic a bit, spent the rest of the show looking for Benoit, who had already left. So, you know, this is a, a staple of Vince McMahon slash Bruce Pritchard booking. Somebody is going to steal somebody else's stuff. And boy, we've got, uh, we've got something actually worth stealing here. Olympic gold medals. what do you think of this creative? I thought it was brilliant because it was so comical and you know, at, at one point it's disrespectful to steal someone's gold medals, but you know, Chris needed more character. He needed, yeah. um, you know, he needed to have, um, you know, just more personality, and, more entertainment. Less yes, right. yes, and I think this re was really helping him because they were really trying to cr push Chris at this particular time very hard. As a matter of fact, they made him look almost invincible in all his matches. So I think they were working on his personality and character, showing the fans he can be entertaining. So that's why we did that. The uh, following SmackDown, you're wrestling Bob Holly, and believe it or not, Bob Holly steals a win with a schoolboy. Of course, Chris Benoit came to ringside wearing your medals, and that distracted you. And ta-da, is this uh, your way of saying, "Hey, sorry about that whole arm thing." <laughs> I don't think so. I, you know, I'm glad that Bob won the match, but I think they were really trying to push Bob. I mean, yeah. Bob was a really great talent. He had a lot to offer to the business. They utilized him to push guys to the main event. He was kind of like the pre main event wrestler that would get guys, you know, uh, give them the push to the main event level. And I think they were trying to push Bob into the main event level. He was very talented. I, I don't think it had anything to do with me injuring him. I think it had a lot to do with they wanted to push him. The following Raw is uh, May 7th, and this is where we see Meltzer become very critical of your creative. He would say, you're still playing the geek role that should have been dropped roughly a year ago. You're going to tell Edge and Christian to grab Benoit if they see him and get the medals. And Meltzer would say, these guys, Edge and Christian, are like the only cool characters left in the company at this point. And it's only because they're sick of hearing you complain. He's very critical, he being Meltzer, of the way creative had been booking you, specifically the, the character of Kurt Angle. He wanted you to have more serious booking. He felt like maybe they were leaning into the comedy nerdy stuff too much. And I want to take just a time out and ask you about that because I do feel like sometimes if you play a character so well outside of wrestling in mainstream entertainment, you get, I believe the phrase is typecast. So to this day, I can't see an old 
television show or movie with James Gandolfini and not think of him as Tony Soprano. He'll always be Tony Soprano to me, even though he did a bunch of characters before. And I suppose a few after, but did you feel like here, Hey man, they're sort of pigeonholing me with this comedy nerdy stuff. And it almost works to your detriment when you're, you're, you're so good at it. They really can't think of doing anything else with you as a result. Do you think that's a, a, a catch 22 of all this? Well, yes, I, but I love doing the comedy stuff. I, I, I would have done it my whole entire career. Uh, if, I, if it was my choice, I would have stuck with it. But Vince McMahon decided he, he wanted me to be taken more seriously due, due to I was an Olympic gold medalist and I was a real life badass. So he decided that my hair versus hair match with Edge, that would be the transition. Even though I wore a wig for a couple of weeks after that and still did some of the comedy stuff. But that was the end of it. That was the very end of my comedy acts for the WWE. And uh, when Ed shaved my head and that transition, I went from Kurt Angle, the dork, the comedy guy, to Kurt Angle, the wrestling machine. And that's where Vince wanted me, the, dire the direction he wanted me to head. Well, they're so focused on the story that the wrestling is just sort of in the background. You're going to have a match here with Bradshaw. And all of a sudden on the big screen, you see a live shot of Chris Benoit at the WWF New York restaurant. So Bradshaw clotheslines you, and then you just leave. There's no bell that rings. There's no official announcement as a winner. They just play Bradshaw's music and you're sprinting to get a car to go to the WWF New York. And, uh, Meltzer would say angle was at WWF New York for a segment that turned out to be ill-advised. Everyone, whether face or heel is cheered like crazy at WWF New York. Benoit, when he does interviews, gets mixed reactions because nobody knows exactly what to make of his interviews. I'm convinced at this point that Benoit has to be a heel because he is just so much more effective as this guy who gave the great faces matches on TV. Sooner or later, the people will turn him because he's good. But telling people he's good without a super strong angle, which they haven't had, and with his interviews not really being up to par and he's being exposed in that regard, it's causing him to go into quicksand. Anyway, the crowd cheered Angle like crazy at WWF New York, and Benoit got no reaction at Nassau. Benoit put the medals down his pants again. So we'll talk about the medals down the pants in a moment. <laughs> but this actually makes sense to me, you know, on, on some level, outside of the context of um, storyline, if you will, if a bunch of wrestling fans are just hanging out at a Hooters or something, and a bad guy walks in and they're all there watching wrestling together. They're going to be excited because, Hey, we've just seen a star and fans, even though you are playing a bad guy here, they really like the job you're doing. So of course they're going to cheer, right? Oh, without a doubt. I was very entertaining and you know, it's New York city. And if you're a WWE superstar, they're going to cheer you loudly. I think that Chris you know, I think that him coming from WCW, which is a completely different territory, if you want to call it a territory, because we don't have territories much anymore. But, you know, they, they felt that he was an outsider. And, and also, you're right about his interviews. He was just really bland and didn't have much character or personality to him. So I think that's why it was very difficult for the fans to make him a baby face. He's an incredible wrestler, and you're right. That, that would eventually get him over as a baby face. But you need to have a strong character to uh, get a chance to really care for you. You know, listen, I'm silly for asking this, I'm sure. But these medals that Benoit's putting down his pants, these are no longer the actual gold medals, right? <laughs> no. Uh, they're, they're gold medals that I won when I was a little kid. Midget wrestling. <laughs> I, I wore those, I grabbed them out of my, um, uh, my, my, uh, metal box and just grabbed a couple of them and decided to use them. And they're from when I was eight or nine years old. <laughs> That's tremendous. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about the build here. We've, um, we're finally going to get the announcement of our wrestling match on May 17th on SmackDown that night on the show, it's you and Regal teaming up against Ben Juan Rick before the match, you're bragging about winning all the gold medals that you won back in 1996. Meanwhile, these fans in Louisville have never won anything, but you're going to get your gold medals back on Sunday. And you also announced the stipulations for your two out of three falls match. 
And your announcement is that you're going to have a wrestling match. And Benoit says your idea sucks, challenges you to be creative. So you agree to a submission match for the second fall. And the third fall if will be a ladder match. Let's take a time out and just talk about the two out of three false concept. I think a lot of people assume if you're going to have a two out of three falls match and you make the stipulation that, Hey, this ladder match that we know everyone wants to see to your point earlier, it is the hot match in the company at the time. Even if we say if a third fall is necessary, it'll be a ladder match, but even announcing that the third fall is a ladder match, we're going in one apiece. We're definitely going to have three falls, right? Oh, without a doubt. Two out of three falls matches, 99% of the time, it goes to the third fall. And the reason right. is the match is advertised as that. Pinfall, submission, ladder match. So if you don't have the ladder involved in the match, you're false advertising. And I think that's the reason why most of these matches go to the third fall. Plus, it's more competitive. You know, when you, when you tie it up, the match becomes more exciting. If you guys just go two falls, I think the match and you know, the WWE tries to keep the fans honest by doing two falls every once in a while. But if you have that too much, uh, you're, you're taking away the excitement of the match. I'm just curious, you know, what's your, what's your take on, you know, the creative at this time, Hey, let's put these guys together in a submission match and we'll make it an Iron Man match. Okay. And now the next one. All right. Now we're going to do two out of three falls, but. We had too many submissions. So we'll only do one of the fall submissions and then we'll do one. That's a pinfall and well, shit, let's do a ladder match too. Did you feel like creative was just out of, out of gas here and we're just throwing stuff against the wall to see what will stick. I mean, clearly they have all the confidence in the world in you two guys as in ring performers, but this doesn't seem like a very well thought out plan so far. Well, I think they, you know, they, they did it because Chris and I were wrestling so much and I'm not sure why we wrestled that in that entire year we had a lot of wrestling matches and i think they wanted to do something different and the latter match was different so um you know for a creative to come up with different ideas and concepts you only have so many and you have to give them you know whatever options you have and the, the latter match was probably one of the only options Let's, uh, let's talk about the creative here on this go home episode of uh, SmackDown. It's May 17th. You angle slam Benoit, and then you realize you have a chance to get your gold medals back from his pants. So you build up the courage, reach down his tights and pull out the medals. And you finally celebrate by kissing them. <laughs> and then you make a, a face like, <laughs> uh, which is hilarious. Um, what did you think when? When I assume Brian or someone hands you the sheet of paper and says, okay, here's what we're doing tonight. Is this one of those moments where you wondered, can I say no? Is that allowed? I don't know that I want to do this. I was excited about it. I thought it was awesome booking. I, you know, to get Angle Slam Benoit, get him down, have a chance to beat him. Instead, grab my medals out of his <laughs> genitalia, hold him up kiss him because I'm excited to get him back and then putting a disgusted look on my face. Like oh, that was gross. And then hold my medals up. And then Chris cross facing me, crippler cross facing me and making me submit and putting my gold medals back in his genitalia again. You can't get any better booking than that. <laughs> it's ridiculous and, and good fun. Um, it is good fun. So at this point, what we want to do is we want you guys to fire up the WWE network. Uh, it's now on Peacock. Uh, so what I did is I clicked, uh, in the little search bar up top judgment day, uh, 2001. And then when you do that, uh, you'll see a whole list of judgment days. You just want to scroll down until you find the one from 2001. And then you want to jump to 12 minutes and 37 seconds. So we'll all try to do that, uh, here together. Now, 12 minutes and 37 seconds. This is going to be fun, man. I've never watched wrestling with you, so I don't know what to expect, but I'm pretty excited about it. This is the first for me too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you haven't already fire up the peacock it's 12 minutes 37 seconds here on uh, the wwe network for judgment day 2001 uh, kurt i think we should probably have you give us a little bit of a countdown and when you say press play we'll all press play all right here we go 10 9 8 7 6 5 
four, three, two, one. Open it up. What? Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, coming up here in a few moments, the two out of three ball matchup. Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle. If it goes three falls, Paul, it'll be Angle's medals on top of the pole, on top of the uh, ring here. Well, this is the way to do it. First fall, pinfalls only. Second fall, submission only. And if they split the falls, the only way to really determine who deserves the medals is to hang them up over the ring and someone has to climb a ladder. And here's the package sort of building it up. And we've sort of told this story. What'd you think of the way they put together these packages back in the day? Oh, they were incredible. They did such an awesome job. All the packages were amazing, especially if you were injured and you came back from injury and they would do like a five minute package on you. Uh, the one that I loved, my favorite was clocks when, uh, uh, you know, when I injured my neck and had the surgery and made my way back. But these, these promos are incredible. I, I thought they did such an amazing job at it. Uh, the name we hear a lot credited in this era was Dave Sahadi. Does that sound right to you? Yes. Dave Sahadi was the man, him and Kevin Sullivan. They, they worked very hard and they were very creative. Just to be clear too. I, I know some of our listeners are probably scratching their head. There's more than one Kevin Sullivan in wrestling. There's <laughs> the guy who does TV in Nashville. And then there's the shoot devil in Florida, right? Yes. Yes. There's <laughs> the guy that does TV in Nashville. That's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of a uh, fun to go back and watch and see this creative because I'll be honest, I was watching it this time, but I don't remember this whole, I'm going to stuff the, uh, the metals down my trunks. That's good stuff. That's funny. It is funny. I, I think that there, this really helped Chris out and, uh, gave him a more versatile character, make him, make, make him have a much more better personality. I want to mention that, uh, Meltzer gave this show. Uh, a decent review. Uh, the, the readers all agreed that you guys had the best match that night. It was nearly unanimous. Uh, overall, the readers of the observer gave the show 54.5% thumbs up, 12.6% thumbs down and 32.9% thumbs in the middle. I guess this is really no surprise. Yeah, the whole company. And I'm sure you and Benoit both expect to steal the show. Anytime you're on pay-per-view and given some time like this, right? Well, when you have wrestlers like Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit go in the ring and face each other, you're going to have the best match of the night every night of the year. It's, you know, Chris and I were like twins. We, we, you know, it was like looking in a mirror and wrestling myself. He was so intense and so technical. Uh, I really enjoyed working with him. It was really easy. And he was just an amazing person. Uh, when Howard Finkel is making the announcement here for the stipulations before the match, they don't get much of a pop, even the latter announcement. Um, I think that's a little weird. Do you think that perhaps fans were, were burnt out on the concept or they just didn't really understand the two out of three false thing? Are there too many gimmicks in this match? I guess is my question. I think perhaps there were too many gimmicks, you know, yeah. having pinfall submission and ladder match. I mean, you know, most fans that understand the business know what we're trying to do, but there are a lot of fair weather fans that might not have known or understood. The, uh, the entrance set here is something that we see a lot of commentary about online where fans these days really miss the themed sets, like the old backlash that had the big hooks that swung and all that. Of course, these days it's just a bunch of led screens, but you can put whatever you want on those screens. Where do you land on that? Do you miss the specific sets for pay-per-view i love the specific sets i thought they were awesome it's just the gave it much more different feel and you know each pay-per-view had a different mood to it it wasn't just a a screen that showed different stuff every pay-per-view it was different setups and different creative uh, designs it was really cool let's listen in to what you're saying here Vicero is very excited because tonight my Olympic medals are coming back home. Tonight, my Olympic gold medals. Crowd chanting up, disparaging remarks. Shut up. <laughs> That's gonna work. Tonight, my Olympic gold medals go from resting against Chris Benoit's genitals to 
to going around my neck once again. And as an added bonus, I'm going to show Chris Benoit just who the best technical wrestler truly is, once and for all. And as far as this ladder match goes, well, Chris Webber has a better shot at coming back to the Kings and winning them a championship. Hold on. Then Chris Benoit does at making this match go to a third fall. It's true, it's damn true. He's right about that, you know. So hold on, medals, because daddy's coming for you. Oh, man, daddy. <laughs> My goodness. Daddy's coming for you. <laughs> I feel like this is I a said the most stupid shit. And I <laughs> just the writers came up with all these different quotes and stuff that I would say. It was just hilarious. It sounded like you were about to launch into a blue chew commercial right there. Daddy's coming <laughs> for you. Yes. So here we see Benoit making his way to the ring. I guess the reminder here, you know, the the old school way of thinking is. We need to make sure the audience knows there's a clear cut good guy and a clear cut bad guy. And based on the reception you got at WWF New York, by having you come out and just dump on the hometown team, we remind them that you're the bad guy, right? Without a doubt. You got to separate the heels from the baby faces, especially when the fans don't know the heel or the baby face is, or they're confused or if there's a tweener. So you go out, cut a promo, a heel promo. So when the baby face does come out, he'll get a cheer. So I'm going to sort of lay out here and let you talk about what we're seeing here. Cause that's what everybody wants to do is sort of listen in on your thinking about the way you put together the match. Well, we started with high action because we wanted to get the pinfall out of the way quickly. We, we wanted to build up for the submission and we wanted to build up for the ladder match and we didn't have a lot of time to do it. So we wanted to get the pinfall out of the way as quickly as possible. So this is pretty much it here. I think we're going right into the finish. And it's interesting. You're doing his German suplex spot. Now you're doing his. <laughs> and now he's real nice. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, he hits me with the angle slam and beats me with a pinfall. And the reaction that was up weird. one to zero. Huh? Yeah, I mean, it's a minute and seven seconds, and they're they're playing your music and and they raise your hand and then you're right back at it again. That has to be probably a little confusing to some of the fans, though. Like, wait a minute, it's over. Yes, I think we might have gone a little bit too early, but we did want to put some time in for the submission trade-offs and also for the ladder match, telling the story of the ladder. So the, the least um, popular of the three was the pinfall. We wanted to get that out of the way as quickly as we could. And you guys have some pretty innovative spots here. I, I just rewatched this match for the first time since it happened before we uh, clicked record today. And I saw something that I don't think I had ever seen up to that point, and I didn't remember you guys doing. There you are going into the steps. How bad are those step spots? Is it as bad as we imagine? Yeah, they hurt, <laughs> especially if you hit the corner. But, you know, if you can if you can do it right, if you can throw your back into it, um, it doesn't hurt as much. But if you throw your shoulder into it, it's going to hurt pretty badly. But, you know, the ridges in the corner are what does the damage to the body. Yeah, I'm sure that could cut a dude up, too, if it wanted to. Without a doubt. So I think this is, uh, we're about to set up a spot where you're going to crotch Benoit around the ring post. This Here is a go. real creative spot. Chris Benoit came up with that one. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'd never That's seen that. That's how you get the baby face down. That's a heel move right there. Oh, yeah. Meltzer would say, and also... Uh, an almost ECW-ish from five years ago where fans have seen so much, but it's a spot you can rely on because people buy it. I mean, I think that's it, right? You, you have to sort of suspend your disbelief sometimes with wrestling, but every guy watching that can imagine, oh, I don't want to take that. Without a doubt, you're going to cringe when you see that move. <laughs> yeah. I'm beating the hell out of Chris right now. Uh, I'm trying to soften him up, get him ready for the submission portion of the match. What's sort of the basic structure of, of a wrestling match? Forget that this is two out of three falls, but you know, a lot of wrestling fans have heard terms like, okay, we got to get the heat. We got to have the shine. We got to cut them off, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sort of break down your philosophy on the multiple acts that you need to have in a basic match. 
Well, philosophy in a match is when you start, you want to start with wrestling, um, you know, pro or amateur, whatever you choose. And you want the baby face to out wrestle the heel. And you want the heel to get frustrated to the point where they do something cheap to get the baby face down to start the heat. That's when you get, that's when you work over the baby face during the heat. And uh, you have uh, some false comebacks, false hope spots. That means um, uh, where you're, you're acting like Chris is going to make the comeback, but you shut him down again. You do a few of those in the match, try to get the fans riled up, and then you put them in a rest hold and they start coming with the baby face. If the baby face shows some fire, and you get you come up and you end up doing a double down. That's when you both are selling down on the mat. And that's when the comeback starts. So that's when the baby face makes a comeback. They make the comeback. You have your false finishes back and forth. And then you have the finish. If the baby face wins, he's going to win straight up. If the heel, heel wins, he's most likely going to cheat the win. There you go. That, that's the simple psychology of a wrestling match. Melzer is uh, pretty critical here. He says angles calling spots was pretty audible in spots. Um, outside of Melzer's criticism here, did anybody ever say, Hey man, you're, uh, you're being too loud. Vince McMahon really? <laughs> told me, yeah. He said, listen, you got to tone it down. The TV's picking up on your calling your spots. And I said, Vince, I can't help it. I, I want my opponent to know where he's going at every particular moment. So I, I, I call the match not only for my opponent, but for myself too. And I'm pretty loud with it. I've always been that way. I never changed. <laughs> Even though Vince McMahon talked to me a couple of times, I still did it. I just felt that being safe more, more than sorry was a better choice. Sure. I know people were critical of, uh, of John Cena for the same thing that they thought he perhaps was a little too loud as well. Yeah, some guys will act like they're talking shit while they're, you know, yeah. moving their head like they're talking, but they're saying a spot. Right. I couldn't do that. <laughs> I'm not that intelligent. <laughs> I have to think about what I have to say and say it. <laughs> That's funny. When, when you go back and you watch your stuff from back in the day, do you sort of um, beat yourself up about it or can you appreciate it for what it was? I asked because I read an interview with Daniel Bryan years ago. And he says he can't watch his old matches because he feels like he's just evolved as an in-ring performer. And he knows if he had it to do over again, he would do so much of that stuff differently. Is that sort of the same thing for you or does that not really exist for you? It, it doesn't exist for me. I, I was really proud of the matches I had. And, and you know, I, I will be critical on how I look, you know, I but, but not on my performance. My performance was always great. I always thought I had solid matches and, I don't think I could have done much different. Uh, I, th there are times when I was real stupid and I did some dumbass shit. <laughs> like moon salts off the top of a cage, and <laughs> diving, you know, off the ramp onto the floor on a, on a wrestler. But um, other than that, I don't have any regrets of my career. How much of uh, this stuff that we're seeing would have been uh, called in the ring and how much are you guys actually calling here? Uh, before you actually come out through the curtain we have probably five or six various spots during this portion of the match for the submission uh, portion and uh everything else was ad lit so the heat uh you know some of the um, submission holds that we put in were just called right there but we have five or six spots that are um throughout the different portion of the show of the match we're, we're going to do different submission trade-offs. But for the most part, you have to ad-lib that part. Uh, you can only uh, plan the spots that you want, uh, especially for the submission finish. Talk to me a little bit about uh, in this era, or when, when you guys come to the building, let's say there's a 1 o'clock call time, are you trying to make your way down to the ring and just do a bit of a walkthrough or when you're calling a match or going over spots beforehand, are you still just doing that in the back in this era? Uh, we are, we still go, we went with TV and pay-per-view, uh, not, not house shows. You, we wouldn't go on the ring, but TV and pay-per-view, we would go out to the ring and get a feel for what we wanted to do because it was really important to the boss, Vince McMahon. 
We had to make sure that our show was tight. Uh, our performance was awesome. Uh, definitely at TVs and pay-per-views. So we'd have to practice some of the stuff in the ring. So when you're doing that in this era, is an agent coming down with you or do they just trust you guys, you know, to just figure it out? They've always had agents. And for the most part, agents are with the wrestlers and they, they help the wrestlers come up with ideas and concepts for the match. So the a agent is very crucial in the match. Usually the agent will come up with two or three different ideas for your match. I mean, for, for the most part, the two wrestlers that are going to wrestle in the match put the match together, but the agent comes up with some clever ideas. What do you think of uh, referee Jack Doan here? How was he as uh, the third man in the ring? Jack was good. I enjoyed working with him. He, he would, um, you know, he related messages properly. He got all his false finishes in order. He was, he was really good. He was on top of stuff. This is another submission that was called in the ring. This was not uh, planned. So the, these are, you know, the, these are different ones, false finishes for submission that to, to try to kill some time so that we could get to build up to the submission finish. Did you ever uh, see Ric Flair put somebody in a figure four in a bar in real life? <laughs> no, but that would be awesome. Has he done that? Oh yeah. Many times, many times. <laughs> I heard he would uh, come to the bar with a robe on and take his robe off and he'd be naked. Like he just did some crazy ass stuff in his lifetime. He's had a lot of fun, but once, in, once upon a time, some, uh, some pro ball players were sort of poking holes saying that, Oh, that figure four don't beat nobody. And he said, and we put it on and they <laughs> said, yes. So he really legitimately applied it. And I think they were regretting that decision. Oh yeah. It can hurt. If you do a shoot figure four, it can hurt. Yes. Yeah. What about Sacramento? How was this as a crowd? You know, you and I've talked about how Chicago is always such a hot crowd. New York's always a hot crowd. Sacramento, where do they rank? They're up there. They're in the top seven or eight. They they have a good history of uh, wrestling uh, fans. They they've always been very responsive and uh, just a very excited crowd. It's been a lot of fun uh, wrestling there, especially when I got to do my milk truck incident. That was in Sacramento. Ah. It was a great moment. That's the cool. Fans went absolutely crazy. historically as you said earlier um it feels like at this point in the match that we would be in the quote-unquote heat portion but now the baby face is taking control uh, did benoit usually quote-unquote call the match not necessarily because he was a heel but because he was the veteran of the two of you no chris was surprisingly he's so versatile that he wanted me to call the match he was game for anything. So I came up with most of the ideas and I would actually call the match. Uh, you know, Chris was really, uh, he, he, he was able to adapt to any wrestler. So if you came up with incredible ideas that, uh, that Chris, you know, uh, would have to challenge himself, he would want to do it. So he was really easy to work with. And, you know, most of the ideas and concepts came from me and I would call the match. And I think that Chris was trying to get me to learn quicker because at this point in my career, I think I've only been in the business two years Yeah, and having that experience of leading the match, which I was ready for. I think Chris wanted me to do that. In a match like this, you know, where it's not necessarily the stress of we're playing a beat the clock thing or a submission thing, or we're going to do something right at the 30 minute mark or what have you. I assume that Jack Doan through his earpiece is getting some sort of time cue. Would he tell you guys at a certain point, like, Hey, five minutes or something like that. I mean, I, we were all familiar listening to this, the phrase go home, but when does he give you a heads up that you need to start your finishing sequence? Or is that something you say ahead of time? Like, Hey Jack, we've got three minutes worth of stuff when it's time. Just give me a heads up. Well, we, we try to plan out, especially a three falls match. You have to plan out the time. Uh, of each fall and you need the referee to tell you every single minute. So, you know, the first fall was in a one minute and 30 seconds. So 
Uh, you know, we when we started the match, we didn't know it needed to know the time. We just knew that we would get to the first fall in a minute and a half. But after that, we had the the uh, the submission was placed at around ten minutes, and then the the latter um, portion or the finish was around twenty two minutes. So we, we would have the referee tell us every minute so we could work up to it. And uh, you know, it, sometimes he wouldn't tell us every minute, but he was pretty pretty good about letting us know where we were in the show. So if we, our match was twenty five minutes we would know where we, how much time we had left. He would just say, we have 13 minutes left. And we would know that's when, that's the time when we need to go to the submission moves. By the way, if you're not watching along with us, uh, fall number two is done. Chris Benoit's tapped out to the ankle lock. So Benoit doing the angle slam to Kurt got pinned fall number one for Chris. Now Kurt's won with the ankle locks. So we're tied at one apiece. It's now a ladder match. And a referee, Jack Doan, went over to the timekeeper, grabbed those gold medals. They lowered the uh, the hook from the top of the ceiling and attached it, which I thought was a nice touch because we promoted if it goes to a third fall, it'll be a ladder match. So uh, it didn't make sense for those medals to already be hanging from the ceiling. You're right. So if it wasn't going to go to a third fall, you don't need to have the medals there. Or yeah. You don't need to have them hanging. Uh so, you know, the medals were at the announcer table until we set up the ladder to do the ladder portion of the match after the submission uh, finish. And there you are looking under the ring. And the ladder, uh, I picked the wrong ladder. Holy shit. This thing was so short. Look, <laughs> <laughs> I got up there. I could barely touch the medals. I, I picked the wrong ladder. I think someone ribbed me and put that underneath the ring. So at this point, you don't know. No, I don't know. I just knew there was a ladder under the ring, and I picked the wrong one. Oh, this is they crazy. had two ladders under there. Well, seems to be Allen, but he's climbing up. And Ben Wall now just, just sees an angle. He's got to go one more step up. And then he's going to the ladder by Chris Ben Wall. By the way, you know, I know Jim Ross made it a famous quote. How do you practice? Falling off a 15 foot ladder or whatever. But when you're taking those big jumps and you're in wrestling boots, you've got to be concerned, dude, I hope I don't twist my ankle here. Right. Yeah. You know, things like that can happen. You just have to, you know, not, not land hard on your feet. You have to stop, you know, land, drop and roll, you know, so that your body uh, doesn't get much of the impact. It's like, like landing in sections, your feet, then your knees, then your hip, then your arm and then your shoulder. Uh, you do that properly, you won't get hurt. But if you try to land on your feet and stay standing, you could twist your ankle. So now the well, real ladder, the big one. <laughs> and, and the way you can tell, by the way, is the company, for whatever reason, would go out and spray paint the ladders black ahead of time. I guess Vince and Kevin Dunn just thought that looked better than a regular red ladder like you had? Yeah, it absolutely looks much better. <laughs> so... I think they just wanted to be uniformity with the ring. You know, the, the ring Color curtains are yeah. black and, you know, the, the turnbuckles are black. So they wanted a black ladder to match. I want to mention, as you guys are really starting to get going here, as you set up a big snap suplex, Benoit's pulling double duty. So not only is he working three falls with you here. Oh, this is a great top-down shot here. He takes a big tumble. He's going to come out later and actually win a tag team turmoil match teaming with Chris Jericho. Boy, they're really trying whatever they can to uh, strap the old rocket ship to Chris Benoit here in 2001, aren't they? Without a doubt. That was the plan. Chris was the guy back then. They were, me too. They, they were really trying to push me really hard as well. But Chris and I were the next upcoming guys. We were the guys that were going to carry the company for the next several years, at least until John Cena got there. And, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, sure know. That, I'm sure that on some level even though you've often talked about him being a dream opponent with your patriotism and and the squeaky clean image but the phenomenal you know wrestling pedigree that you had i'm sure vince thought this could be my next bret hart right he could be the guy who's going to be the face of the company like bret was years before yes i think that was the whole idea is you know he saw olympic gold oh. medalist I stayed out of trouble at the time, at that particular time. Unfortunately, I didn't stay out of trouble for good. And that, that, that's what got me, you know, 
why the interest strayed away from me in WWE is when I started getting the injuries and the painkiller problem, I started getting less interest from the big guy and John Cena started to transpire and, you know, he kind of took over my spot, which I don't blame the company for. Just so you take one hellacious ladder shot there. What's the worst part about working with a ladder? Uh, it's, you know what? It's hard to handle. Like it's just really difficult to hold it and, and make it look like a good shot. Like it's, it's really difficult to lay in with a, with a ladder. It's really unorthodox. So you have to be really careful about what you do and you have to be careful with your fingers too, because you can trap them. Boy, there's something the rest of the listeners are going to be upset with me if I don't ask. Kurt, do you know where you guys got your ladders? Where we got our ladders? I don't know. Uh, maybe the Home Depot. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce has made a joke for years. Ladders are us. So, <laughs> ladders are us. Whatever you're looking for, you know. Hey, Bruce, where'd you, where did Kurt get you the extra gold medals? Gold medals are us. Like, whatever it is, are us. That's the, the Bruce Pritchard joke. That's a generic statement. <laughs> oh, big catapult spot into the ladder miscommunication there you think or y'all just figuring out what do we do from here no just we were trying to line ourselves the opposite corner of the ladder so we could set up this spot which i there botched we go. right here i botched this spot i was supposed to climb up and get to the top of the ladder and then chris was going to pull me down that was supposed to happen but i was supposed to be higher on the ladder i just couldn't get my ass up there but you know what though in a real fight i mean that's the way stuff like that would happen right it, it couldn't be perfect and polished every time yeah, but why am I climbing a ladder? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It makes no sense. Yeah, you're not Shelton Benjamin. You're not going to do a flip off of that thing or something. Right. Chris was very safe on the Germans, too. He could have German me on that on that ladder, and he turned real quickly. Yes, he did. Yeah, he, he was really safe in the ring. I was going to say, you know, that's one of the things you've got to be mindful of is usually you're in that 20 by 20 or whatever it is. And if something's flying around, the referee will get out of the way. But this ladder, as Chris Hero used to say, this ladder don't know how to work. So it's just going to lay there. <laughs> you got to be mindful <laughs> of the ladder. It's not moving for you. Without a doubt. You're absolutely right. At this point, um, See you calling the spot here for the big oof. Well, this well, you know, this is the portion of the match where you have to utilize the ladder in a creative way to make it part of the match. So you have to use it as a weapon before you utilize it to get the gold medals. So that, that's what a ladder match, the psychology of a ladder match is. You base the match around the ladder. Who would have been sort of your go-to from an agent standpoint, if you're working in a ladder match and you want to go pick somebody's brain, who would you hope to talk to? Oh, the, a lot of good ones. You know, Johnny Laurinaitis was really innovative with that stuff. I think that I would pick Johnny at all times. He was really good with that stuff. He really was your favorite agent, wasn't he? Him and Pat. Yeah, him and Pat. Pat Patterson was incredible. Pat was a little more old school, but he, 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 you know, adapted with the business and, you know, made himself new school. But Johnny was just really innovated with incredible ideas. That that was a really cool spot. The yes, it was. Jack of right under, underneath my chin. Here we go. Chris is pinning me down. This was a cool spot, too, because uh, this was something that I don't think has been done before before this time chris came up with this idea to trap me and to climb the ladder and make it look like he was going to win but surprisingly i'm able to do this <laughs> that was a cool spot talk to me about that spot where you're on top of the ladder you're going to take the big bump down and bounce off the top rope uh as somebody just watching at home that feels really dangerous is it it is dangerous. I mean, you know, depending on how you land, you could you could uh, over rotate and uh, go over the top rope and land on the floor. Um, you know, you could miss the rope with your arm and 
catch your chin on it, which could hurt extremely badly. <laughs> uh, so th there are a lot of things that can happen, but this was done perfectly. He draped his arm over the rope and was able to get it, uh, get his arm over so he could do a successful bump. So remember what's happening here now, even though Benoit has the crippler crossface on, it doesn't matter because this is not a submission fall. The pinfalls are done. The submissions are done. It's all about the ladder. And here come Edge and Christian. Let's track it. It's a disqualification. I know it's not a disqualification. These two buffoons, Edge and Christian, Kurt Angle's buddy, getting their angles going up for the medals. And Christian fighting Ben Wall on the outside. This is not right, Paul. Angle wins. Angle wins. It took three people to beat Chris Benoit. Here is your winner, Kurt Angle. So we heard JR on the call there. It took three people to beat Chris Benoit. So I guess the old thing in wrestling is it's not who goes over, it's who gets over. And if it took three people to beat Benoit, he's no worse for wear coming up on the short end of the stick here, right? Oh, yeah, this was a huge push for Chris, and it was also a good push for me because I got great heat getting my buddies involved in a match and winning back my gold medals. I won the match, but I got heat for it. Chris was indestructible. He was unbeatable, and that that's how you get over. I mean, you know, when they, when they make you look super strong, um, you're, you're going to become a lot more popular. This is uh, the end of your feud with Chris Benoit in 2001. The next night, you'll start working with Shane O'Mac, which, yes, boys and girls, that means we're going to talk about King of the Rings sooner rather than later. Before we run down the schedule of what we've got coming up, I feel like we should remind everybody that after a grueling performance like that, you probably need to get in the back and scarf down some protein, right? <laughs> yes. Physically fit chicken snacks and snack smart crispy protein bites. Check it out it's if you have it 11 different flavors. You have the plant protein and the chicken protein. They're incredible. Uh, sweet barbecue, sriracha, honey mustard. We have so many Kung Po, cinnamon swirl, sour cream and onion. They're incredible. It's an incredible product. You can get them at physicallyfit.com. And you can use Angle Pod as your promo for 20% off. How about that? The bags are only $9.99 and you can save 20% off when you use our promo code AnglePod over at physicallyfit.com. What you want to do? What I want to say, Conrad, is you know, a lot of the fans wonder why it's so expensive. It's not expensive. There's seven servings in the bag. That's right. So you continue to use it throughout the day. So for for how how little that we're charging, it's actually pretty cheap for the amount of servings you get. That's a great call, you know, because if you're looking at some sort of, maybe you're going to the gas station and you get the little snack pack, that's a one use done. That's a one and done type deal. Seven different servings here for nine 99. And that's before you take 20% off. So you're going to be about eight bucks in. And by the way, that code doesn't just save you 20% on one item. It's off your entire order. So order as much as you'd like, try them all, find your favorite. We just learned last week that the Orton family really likes the cinnamon. I think your favorite is the Buffalo wing. Sriracha is still a big hit here at the house. I think every lady and child on earth loves cinnamon swirl most. Would we agree? Without a doubt, Kim Morton absolutely loves them. Randy has to hide them from her. <laughs> so my, my wife, she asks every day for more cinnamon swirl chicken snacks. I, I can't supply them enough for her. So I have to go to the physically fit uh, headquarters and pick them up almost every day. So check them out. You can do it at physicallyfit.com. You click on where to buy. You can find retailers in your area. I mentioned a few times here on the show before. I've got three within driving distance, one just two miles from my house. But you can save some cash and just go ahead and click uh, order online. And they'll ship to all 48 states right here. Angle Pod will save you 20% off. Oh, by the way, you can also find it on Amazon as well. But the promo code only works at physicallyfit.com. Let's get to the questions, though, man. We've got a lot of questions about this. Uh, Michael McClanahan wants to know, does Kurt believe the two out of three fall stipulation is too predictable in most circumstances? It seems the series almost certainly goes three falls. Well, there's a reason for it. You know, when you have two out of three falls, you're advertising the whole match. So if you have a submission and pinfall involved and also a ladder match, you want to make sure all three of those are involved in the match. 
So if, if the third fall goes to a ladder and you don't have the ladder, you're false advertising. So you're not, you're not, you're not being honest with the fans and you're not getting what they paid for. Maybe the most common question we got, Christopher Townsend wants to know what was your favorite match with Chris Benoit? Of course, you had a series of matches here in 2001. I think everybody remembers WrestleMania 17 backlash, which was uh, the pay-per-view right prior to this and now judgment day. So three pay-per-view shows in a row. Did you have a favorite of those three? Yeah. My favorite was WrestleMania 17. I mean, you know, anytime you wrestle a WrestleMania, you're going to put on your best performance. I would say backlash was second and this match was a close third. Uh, but, but, but my favorite of all time against Chris Benoit was Royal rumble 2003. That was a great mixture of wrestling, submission trade-offs, false finishes, and an incredible finish. Well, we're going to be pumped about next week. We're not done. We're keeping the hits rolling. Next week, we're going to be talking about the 2006 draft and how Kurt was drafted to ECW. Uh, it's an interesting time in Kurt's professional career here in 2006, and we're going to break down the jump to the extreme next week. Then we'll get June started. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to pay tribute. Uh, to someone who meant a lot to you, Mr. David Schultz. And if I tried to describe this whole story, no one would believe it. Give everybody sort of a peek behind the curtain about who David was to you. Dave was my coach. He was my mentor. He was considered in my mind, the greatest wrestler, amateur wrestler of all time. He, uh, he was able to uh, make the Olympic team right out of high school. He was wow. just incredible. And he won a gold medal in the Olympics he won a world championship. Uh, he was the coach at Foxcatcher, and he taught me so much about wrestling uh, that uh, I couldn't thank him enough. He was very crucial in my career. And we're going to talk about him on his birthday, uh, which will be on June 6th. Uh, the following week, June 13th, it's all about Shane McMahon and the street fight from King of the Ring 2001. We'll be back on the 20th with One Night Stand 2006. At the Hammerstein Ballroom, you just heard Randy Orton talk about that a couple of weeks ago. And then we'll finish out the month of June with Vengeance 06, another Randy Orton uh, uh, match here in 2006. Boy, we, uh, we've had a lot of fun sort of switching things up a little bit. And uh, I guess we can reveal that we're going to continue this interview format. We're going to do more watch-alongs. We're going to do more Ask Kurt Anythings. We're sort of throwing out the rule book, rule book and we're going to have a lot of fun here in the coming months on the angle show. Are we not? I get it. It's a wrestling podcast, but he's saving us money on our mortgage. Do you really trust this process? The reviews don't lie. Five-star review after five-star review. We make it fast. We make it easy and it's no cost or obligation. Give us a shot to earn your business. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did, especially if you like keeping more of your own money. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. So what are you waiting for? Hurry to save with Conrad.com. Yes, we will have a lot of fun. We're going to do all that stuff and more. We're going to have an absolute great time. I promise you. So check it out. If you haven't already, uh, you can also pick up all your autograph stuff. I, I, I mention this every week because I don't think a lot of people are doing this. But not only can you get some cool stuff over at KurtAnglebrand.com, like autographed birthday cards and photos, you can even get cowboy hats and milk cartons. I think the coolest thing you do, besides cameos and T-shirts and everything else that you can get at Kurt Angle Brand, is if somebody has a Kurt Angle collectible, or maybe they met you at a meet and greet years ago and had their photo made, they can send that to you. You'll autograph it and send it back, right? Without a doubt. Uh, the address is on my website, KurtAnglebrand.com. You send the item to my address. I will sign it the way you want it to. Just send me a small donation for charity, and uh, it'll be delivered to you within the next couple of weeks. By the way, you get all these shows that we've sort of previewed early and ad-free over at adfreeshows.com. And, Kurt, just a few weeks ago, you did your very first Kurt Angle Live uh, for ad-free shows where fans got to jump on a Zoom and ask you questions. What would you think? How did that go? That was really cool. Uh, the, the people there that run that, they're, they're just awesome. And uh, it was really organized. The fans asked a lot of great questions. I really had a great time doing it. I'm going to do it again soon. So check it out if you haven't already. Consider joining us over at adfreeshows.com. You're going to get more bang for your buck. Not only do you get a lot of great bonus content with no commercials, but interactive experiences you really just can't get anywhere else. Uh, and speaking of stuff you can't get anywhere else, all this protein and such little sugar, 
It's physicallyfit.com. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. We keep mentioning chicken snacks because this isn't just a company that Kurt endorses. This is Kurt's deal, man. So the best way to support the show is to pick up some chicken snacks. I'm telling you, you're going to be glad you did. Until next week, he is Kurt Angle. I am at Hey Hey, it's Conrad, and we are out of time. We'll see you back right here on the Kurt Angle Show. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.